Why did you come to church today? You ever ask yourself that question? It's a rhetorical question. Please don't speak. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. Why did you choose to make Clearwood Baptist Church your home? I found it interesting of the top seven reasons why people decide to choose a church. I want to share them with you. First of all, 83% of the people polled in this survey said they became a part of a church because of the quality of the sermons. 79% of the people said they, cho they chose the church because they felt welcomed by the leaders. 74% of those who chose a church home said it was because of the style of service. 70% said location. 56% said of the education for children and teenagers. Number six, having family and friends in the congregation. 48% said that. And 42% said the availability of volunteering in different ministries. I don't know about you, but as I read these and as I read other polls, I've been greatly troubled of the reasons why people decide to choose a church home. Have you ever noticed most people decide a church home based upon the music that is sung rather than the messages that are preached? Today, I, I am very concerned that perhaps the reason why folks choose churches today have nothing to do with the way they believe. You see, the number one reason why somebody to make a church their church home is not about the pastor's personality or, or how gifted of an orator he may be, not about those in leadership making their uh, way out to try to uh, make people feel welcome. That's not the reasons. I'm sure that's part of it, sure. But the reason why somebody should make a church their church home is based upon the articles of faith of what that church believes. You know, I find it interesting that, that most people within the modern church, when they go to the Articles of Faith on, on a church website or a denominational website, in fact, the more I research Articles of Faith, the more I realize that most churches, anybody could be a part of that church because the belief system is so vague. And so today, as we come to this passage, I want to share with you that, that Paul had a conflict that he was trying to combat against here in these five verses. And this conflict was so severe in Asia Minor that it was creeping in other cities, not just the city of Colossae. We find that the church of Laodicea is mentioned here in this passage. You, you remember that church from the book of Revelation, how they were lukewarm, and the Bible says that, that God would rather spit them out of His mouth. He'd rather for them to be hot or cold than to be lukewarm. So I wonder today, why did you make Clearwood Baptist Church your church home? I'm sure you could list many different reasons, and in fact, the more I begin, the more I reach out into the community, the more I talk to people, the more I talk to visitors, the more I realize people have a list about a mile long of their grievances and complaints of why or why not they should join a church. The number one reason is the Articles of Faith, of what the body of believers believes. Today, I want to share with you the sixth step in combating doctrinal heresy is understanding sound Bible doctrine. Today, I want to label my thoughts with these words. Be concerned about sound doctrine. Be concerned about sound doctrine. I know today's sermon may not be the most popular sermon or, or the sermon that you, that's on your top ten list of your favorite of the year, but I'm here to tell you something. This is probably the most important sermon that will ever be preached this year at our church. Today I want to share a statement with you that's going to summarize not just these five verses, but also the content of my sermon, and I want you to walk away with this thought. Sound Bible doctrine is important to the mature Christian. Sound Bible doctrine is important to a mature Christian. An immature Christian decides they make a church home based upon the song selection. 
An immature Christian decides that they're going to make a church their church home because they have chairs instead of pews. An immature Christian is going to decide they're going to make a church home based upon the minister or the pastoral staff's personality and charisma. Today I'm here to tell you something, that the reason why you should choose a church home is based upon the Word of God. It's declaration and what is being taught from the pulpits and the classrooms within that local body of believers. Today I want to share with you three thoughts about sound doctrine. In verses 1 through 3, I wrote down these three words. Believe sound doctrine. As I read verse number 4, I wrote down these three words. Reject false doctrine. And as I read verse number 5, I wrote down thirdly. Receive sound doctrine. Will you come with me as we move through this passage? Look at verse number 1, 2, and 3. As I read these three verses, I wrote down these three words. Believe sound doctrine. Would you say that with me? Believe. Believe sound doctrine. Maybe you want to write in your margin of your Bible or, or take note of this and make it personal. I choose to believe sound doctrine. Or I will believe sound doctrine. Remember, this book of the Bible, these four chapters, this, this short little letter that Paul wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God was, was being written to the believers in a city called Colossae in the Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. You can look in your Bible map there in the back of your Bible to kind of get an idea of where it is just north of the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the right. And here we find that, that as Paul was writing this letter, he was writing to a group of believers that most likely he never met because this was a church that he never started. Started. It was started as a result of his ministry, fruit from his ministry. And here, as he's writing, he's writing about the importance of Christ being preeminent in people's lives. He's writing about the deity of Christ and some of the great doctrines of the Christian faith. And also, he's revealing to these believers his state of affairs. But as we come to verse number one, he says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you. You know, I've noticed over the years that ministry will always have conflicts. It will. You know, we, we battle against sin. We do. And it's one of the great conflicts of the Christian life is battling against sin. But I'm here to tell you something. Another great conflict we face as believers is sound Bible doctrine. It's a great conflict. It's why there's so much division within the modern church today. It's why there's so many denominations out there. Because somebody interprets this passage a little bit differently than somebody else. But I'm here to tell you, sometimes it's important that we take a stand on a particular interpretation because it is what we believe firmly and strongly of what the Word of God is proclaiming. But notice here, it mentions Colossae earlier. In fact, the word Colossae, this name is the only time it's found in the Bible is in the book of Colossians. But it also mentions Laodicea here. You know about this church we refer to in the book of Revelation, the seven churches of Asia. And here he says that this conflict, it was something that was very troublesome to the Apostle Paul's heart. And I submit to you it should be very troublesome to our heart today too. I'm not saying you have to have a PhD in theology. I'm not saying you have to understand every jot and tittle of Bible doctrine from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. I'm not saying that because God knows I surely don't understand all of it. <laughs> so may God help all of us. But here as we look in this text we know that, that Paul was combating against certain conflicts. And as I read these three verses I want to share this thought with you. Believe sound doctrine. It's not enough to just listen to a preacher like myself share God's Word. you got to get in it and study it for yourself. It's not enough just to go to a Bible college or to go to seminary and get all the accolades and degrees and, and to develop all the connections. It's more than that. It's digging in deep into God's Word personally so that we can understand and say, okay, now I understand why my church holds to this position. And by the way, if you've never read the Articles of Faith of our church, you need to do so before it's eternally too late for you. <laughs> but here in verse 1, we find Paul displays his conflict. But I want to share with you a few thoughts from, verses, from verse 2 and verse 3. As I read the first part of verse 2, where it says, "...that their hearts might be comforted." 
Let's back up. He says, And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So many of the people here in these cities, they haven't seen Paul face to face. And, and there's many people that would read this letter like you and like me who never seen the Apostle Paul's face that we benefit from. But verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted. Would you say comfort with me? Comfort. Say it again, please. Comfort. I wrote down this. Comfort believers with sound doctrine. Comfort believers with sound doctrine. There was a day when I was comforted by the sound teaching of the Word of God about salvation and how I received Christ as my Savior and I believed on His name. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God and because somebody declared the gospel and I, I believed on that now my soul, not just my body, not just the life here and now, but the life then and there to come is comforted. In fact, Paul was writing to the believers in Thessalonica and he says in verse number 18 of chapter 4, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And you know the context is? It's, a, it's about the second coming and the rapture of the church. The second coming of Christ and the rapturing of the church. So now we can, we can comfort one another knowing that Jesus Christ is going to come again and that the body of believers will be raptured out to be with Christ forevermore. And so Paul was writing to comfort these believers' hearts and their minds with sound Bible doctrine. Look, it goes on, that their hearts might be comforted. So I wrote down, comfort believers with sound doctrine. But as, as the verse goes on, it says, being knit together in love. Now, when I was in high school, uh, excuse me, let's back up. When I was in middle school, I had to take, uh, you know, the, the class with cooking. And I guess it's called home ec. Is that what it's called? Good. <laughs> I choose to forget a few things in my lifetime. But anyways, as I was in there, I had to make the monkey bread. You know, like the, the bread that's very good with cinnamon on it. It was really good. I don't know if the bread I made was any good, but, but the stuff that I ate from, from the other peers and some of the teachers was really, really good. I remember that we had to get together and we had to have a sewing machine and we had to sew a pillow and, and a little bag. And believe it or not, I successfully did that as a seventh grader <laughs> in middle school. But nonetheless, as I, I, I read about this word knit, being knit together, I'm reminded that as a person gets a sewing machine out and begins to sew uh, 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 and begins to make all the different things with a sewing machine, I'm reminded that here, it says here, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love. So I wrote down another thought, not just comfort believers with sound doctrine, but I wrote down this, unite believers with sound doctrine. You know why it's important that we have an Articles of Faith of our church? So that we can agree that this is what we are going to hold to. And we can move forward on that. You see, there's going to be times where, where even though we have an Articles of Faith, sometimes things are not in there for a specific purpose because we know that it's not an essential part of, of being a child of God and, and moving forward with the Gospel. But the reason why we have some of those things in the Articles of Faith is because we need to know that it's important. And in order to successfully minister in our area, we've got to move forward with it. And the way we can be united as a church is through the Word of God. Sure, we can be united together with our preference of how we dress when we come to church. We clean up pretty nice, don't we? Well, for the most part, that is. <laughs> we, we get together, we sing uh, the, the prime and proper hymns of the faith from the hymnal. We get together, we do that, and it's great. But I'm telling you, it's far more than just what we wear, what we sing, and which version of the Bible that we're using. It's about uniting together with sound Bible doctrine. But notice, it goes on to say, And unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. Hold, pause, please. Uh, remember earlier in our, in our book, the Bible talked about the mystery of God. It, it talked about it early, early in chapter 1. And the mystery was this, that, that, that there's a truth that God kept revealed. He hid it from society. And now He's made His mystery revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ, how Christ would come and die on the cross and, and be the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. And now uh, there's no need for sacrifices and rituals anymore like in the Old Testament. Now Jesus did rise from the grave and now we have clear access to God the Father. We don't have to go through a priest anymore because we are priests after the order of Melchizedek the Bible talks about. And here as I read verses 2 and 3 it says, verse 3, in whom 
We are in whom are hid. Speaking of Jesus Christ, this is the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Just a few moments ago, I shared with the children about, about money. And I'm here to tell you something. It doesn't matter how many, how many credit cards you have. It doesn't matter how much money you have. None of that can, can compare to... It. Listen, you, you can have as many credit cards as you want to, but none of that... You can have as many bank accounts as you want, as much royalty, if you will, as you might want, but it will never compare to the riches that are found in Jesus Christ. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I'm afraid that modern Christianity has placed their treasure in their wallet instead of the wonderful counselor, Jesus Christ. So I wrote on this. Enrich believers with sound doctrine. Comfort believers with it. Unite believers and enrich. We can enrich our faith when we dig deep and stay a little bit long in the text. But I wonder, is this the only time of the week that you spend meditating in the Scriptures? Is this the only time you open up the Word of God and read it? May God help us to enrich our faith personally by digging into the Word of God. As I read verses 1 through 3, I wrote on this, Believe sound doctrine. Please keep in mind, uh, sound Bible doctrine is important to a mature Christian. Be concerned about sound doctrine. Look at verse 4. As I read verse 4, I wrote down these three words, Reject false doctrine. Reject false doctrine. Would you say that with me? Reject false doctrine. Look at verse 4. It says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Now, you can, you can turn on your television. You can listen to, to, to the televangelists. You can listen to some of these modern hipsters out there uh, trying their, uh, to, to preach the Word of God. But, but I'm here to tell you something. A lot of them are just false teachers and false prophets. So please be careful who you listen to on the television or on the internet or anywhere else you might be listening to preaching. Because our church, or excuse me, the body of Christ, the universal church, has been plagued with many false teachers. And so I'm going to share with you a few thoughts about these false teachers. Look at the word beguile. This word beguile has multiple meanings. But the first meaning, and I want you to write this down or take note of it. Beware of deceptive false teachers. Beware of deceptive false teachers. You know what deception is? We've experienced deception since the beginning of creation. We find in the book of Genesis that, that Adam and Eve were deceived. And, and there they partook in the fruit. And then mankind was instantly fallen from God. We were separated from God. We come short from, the, from God. And now as we look through the scriptures from the Old Testament all the way up to present day, we are all confronted with deception in our world. But deception, my dear friends, is in modern Christianity. Deception is, is in the televangelists when they say, sow a financial seed of, of $5,000 and God will richly bless you with a whole lot more. There's deception in the pulpits of America and perhaps that's why the church in America is not fully blessed by God like it once was. So please, beware of false teachers. They are out to deceive. But this term beguile also means to misreckon, to, dilute, to delude, and to lead astray. So I wrote down this, beware of distractive false teachers. Not just deceptive, but also distractive false teachers. See, see the first step of a false teacher is to deceive you. So they come in and they, they might expose the Word of God and they say, well, this is actually what the Word of God means. And, and they, 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 they go back into history, they, they do all these different things, and they, they try to twist and turn and they deceive. But then they lead people astray. As I'm thinking about things that are going on in the modern church, I honestly think about the homosexual agenda. And listen, I, I, I believe that anybody who is lost can be saved no matter the sin that somebody has committed. 
But there's people that, that are out there today who, who claim the name of Christ and they go to the Word of God in reference to homosexuality and some of these other modern things that have come up and they go to the book of Leviticus and they go to the book of Romans and they go to some of the other passages in Corinthians about homosexuality that the Bible is explicitly clear on. And they twist and they turn and they lead people astray. If it's wrong for adultery to be sin, if it's wrong for if, for, if sexual immorality is sin, if, if if all those things are sin, then we have to admit that homosexuality is not God's method. The Bible says that God has a the, the marriage is between one man and one woman. We could go on and on about how people have been deceived in the modern church, but I hope that you will not be deceived. Or distracted. Also, I want you to take note of, of the word enticing words. <coughs> these words, these two words, it means persuasive language. So I wrote down this Beware of persuasive teachers. Now, I fully understand the Bible says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We have to share the gospel and we give, we give logical, we give, we give clear reasoning from the Word of God and from the, the mind of man to, to why somebody should come to know Christ as Savior. But, 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 but they take this idea, the false teachers do, and they, they deceive, they distract, and then they persuade. And unfortunately, there's been a whole host of Christians that have been persuaded by many of the false teachers in modern Christianity. And I submit to you today that we need to rise up and stand firm on the true Bible doctrine of the Christian faith and move forward. You see, these enticing words, they get up there, these false teachers, and they have a way with words. They could convince a Jewish high priest in the synagogue to eat a ham sandwich. <laughs> I'm telling you, they can. They have the way of deceiving somebody. And then they began to talk about how the way that they believe is not the way they should believe. And then once their argument is placed... They began to literally persuade and change the mind. So I urge you, my dear friends, believe sound doctrine, but please reject false doctrine. May I share with you a third thought today? Not only believe sound doctrine, not only reject false doctrine, but I wrote down thirdly, Receive sound doctrine. Look at verse 5. It says, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. I want to zoom in on a, on a few different phrases here in this verse. Look at the words, your order. Would you say that with me? Your order. Say it again. Your order. We are told by the commentators that this is a military word that means a rank of character. And so I wrote down this. Sound doctrine produces disciplined soldiers. Sound doctrine produces disciplined soldiers. You know, the more I have studied God's Word, the more I have realized that a mature Christian is a disciplined Christian. The more I study the Word of God, the more I realize that, that a mature Christian is going to be a great soldier of their faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here today, as we read these verses, I submit to you that, that we need to receive sound doctrine with open arms. Yes, we need, to re, we need to reject, refuse the false doctrine. We need to believe the sound doctrine. But today, as you receive Receive it and believe it. Take note that it's going to change you. And it's going to make you mature in your faith. Which, by the way, is another reason why Paul was writing this letter. He was writing to help make immature believers become more mature in their faith. Notice the term steadfastness in verse 5. We've looked at the words, your order, but now also look at the word steadfastness. I wrote down secondly, underneath receive sound doctrine. 
sound doctrine not only produces disciplined soldiers, but it also produces stable soldiers. You see, there comes a time in your life where, where you begin to study God's Word and you begin, you begin to get more disciplined in, in, in your maturity level as a believer. You understand the importance of spending time in God's Word. You understand the importance of, of praying. You understand the importance of, of faithfully being a part of a, a localized body of believers. And you begin to do other things as a mature believer as well. But here, I wrote on this, sound doctrine produces stable soldiers. This word said fastness. It literally means somebody who's established in their faith. That means that they're not shallow. Listen, the Bible talks about how when we were as children, we, we acted like a child. But when we became older, we put away childish things. And, and today in modern Christianity, you know what we are doing? We're walking around in the shallow parts of the sea. Somebody who has claimed to be a Christian for, for decades of their life is still walking around in the shallow parts of the Christian life. And I'm here to tell you something. It's time that we move forward and dig deeper. And get more stable in our faith. Amen. You know what Jesus said? He said that a house that's going to be built upon sand, when the wind blows, it'll blow down. Amen. But the house that's built upon the rock will stand and last. So I wonder, is your life built upon the sinking sand or the solid rock, Jesus Christ? This word, your order, these words, and this word steadfastness, it gives the idea of somebody's rank of character, somebody who's established in your faith. But, but when you kind of combine these two together, somebody is disciplined, somebody is stable. I also wrote down this, sound doctrine produces yielded soldiers. We realize that as a mature believer, if you are that state yet, you know that you need to be disciplined, just like a soldier is. You need to be stable, just like a soldier is. That is, when the rain comes and the storm comes in, in, their, in the heat of war and battle, they will remain sure in their duty. But then I also thought about how, when that takes place, they are yielded. And that when, when they receive word and order from, from somebody in charge of them, they yield to that order and they willingly move forward. Are you yielded to the sound doctrine of the Christian faith? Of how God is calling us to go into the world and share the Great Commission, share the Gospel with those who need it. In conclusion, I want to share this with you. Believe it or not, I am a fundamentalist. You see, this term fundamentalist in our world today receives a lot of negative connotation. We think of fundamental Islam and, and fundamental this and fundamental this and fundamental Christianity. But I'm here to tell you something. All you need to do is Google what it means to be a Christian fundamentalist. And you'll figure out that it means that, that I believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. It means that I believe in the literal interpretation of Scripture. It means that I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. I believe in, the, in, in, in Christ's bodily resurrection. I believe in Christ's physical return. And I believe in Christ's substitutionary atonement on the cross. Amen. If you can't believe that, then my dear friends, I say this respectfully, with courage and compassion. Maybe you need to find another place to attend. Be concerned about sound doctrine. Receive it. Believe it and reject false doctrine. Let's pray. Father, we thank